You're listening to KWOU. Coming up next, the amazing, unbelievable adventures of Dr. Theophilus Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald, the Tasmanian emu. Are you still listening? Or have you tuned me out already, till I am nothing more than a bassy rumble in the background of your mental periphery? Ah, well, I don't suppose it matters much anyhow. Help! Help! I'm trapped inside a simulation that's feeding off my eccentricity and forcing me to say, I'm Jasper Beck, and this is the amazing, unbelievable adventures of Dr. Theophilus Crux, <gasps> PhD, and his faithful companion Archibald, the Tasmanian emu. Previously, in this unbelievable tale, we managed to stave off the impending doom ever swinging lazily above our heads by partaking in bacon avocado sliders and jalapeno poppers. While that may seem like a pathetic coping mechanism, and believe me it is, there are certainly more pathetic coping mechanisms that have been readily accepted by the undefined mass that calls itself society as the norm, so we shan't be so judgmental. After all, some people choose to stave off the doom by writing needlessly long and pointless scripts for a weekly radio show that no one save but a few people they care about listens to, assuming they are listening. There must always be an audience to perform for, even if that audience is assumed, or worse yet, invented. They'll do the trick, though. You might be wondering where our quote-unquote main characters are, and to be perfectly honest, so am I. They don't seem to be around Akachaw at the moment, and seeing as you are quite comfortable in your leisurely wicker chair and sandaled feet, I don't suppose either of us feel any particular need to go looking for them. Perhaps you would want to go in on some sliders? Speaking of which, while you're perusing the appetizer menu, have you ever thought about those explosions that seem to randomly occur in various cities recently, almost deleting the progress of whatever effort was made to establish them? No? You don't? Well, I don't blame you. They don't seem to make too much sense, and perhaps that's the point. The sheer appeal of absurd, abject, non-causal annihilation. Similar to the impending end of the world in... Oh, what was it again? 110 days? That seems so comfortably distant, but it's fairly close if you look at it on a calendar. I suppose a temporary solution. Hmm. Are all solutions temporary? Anyway, I suppose the solution would be to stop looking at a calendar and start looking at the ocean. No, not the ocean specifically. I just meant it as an emblem of the beauty of the natural world, viewer-imposed or otherwise. In a similar fashion to the explosions, nature forces itself upon us without its asking, terrifying and wonderful in all its abject, absurd, fish-filled certainty. I firmly believe that all people who have doubted whether or not they exist have done so in a climate-controlled, fuzzy-carpeted room. To be with the ocean is to know with its own certainty on loan that you exist, and to be terrified by the fact. At least in your facticity, you can experience what it's like to, say, drown, for instance. And you revolt against the absurdity of the notion. Sputtering with salt-filled lungs, I choose life, I choose life, I choose life. But can it really be said that that is a logical decision? It appears to me, as you order a strawberry lemonade for the both of us, thank you, by the way, that you made the decision quite impulsively. That it could be argued that your biological nature is simply wired to choose life, and as such you aren't as much choosing as you are dancing to the strings of your DNA as they slowly choke out the resistance they find in their authority in your, uh, spirit, we shall call it. But who cares whether it's a logical decision? Does not the adherence to logic imply a meta narrative you're abjectly applying to life? Well, perhaps, but even your objection to that now is fundamentally a logic appeal. Why, why are you playing the game you say is meaningless? If you truly must live without appeal to anything, not even to the lattice work of logic, then you must admit, as much as you can must anything, that it's all the same. The world has flattened itself, and you can no more accuse me of inauthenticity than you can congratulate a slab of granite for its commitment to the Apollonian aesthetic. I believe you're correct, if for no other reason than you're me. Fundamentally, 
and that I can't quite seem to see out of the fog around my eyes, or more aptly within my eyes. Oh, what I would give for the fog to be from without, for then I could at least see the fog, but at the moment I feel like I'm trapped in my own head, and I need something to penetrate it. To be with the ocean is to know you exist, but the motion of the ocean does not quell the mist. It's like Dostoevsky said, after all of it, I have still got a headache. I don't think any amount of poetic or philosophical acrobatics will allow me to surmount the stone wall that denies my ability to deny stone walls. Sure, I don't have to be reconciled to them, but that decision is as equally important or non-important, take your pick, as bowing down and worshipping them. In fact, to a large extent, that's what I've been doing for a long time now. I don't think I'm necessarily trying to go anywhere with this, as much as observe that I haven't been going anywhere, that all this vibrance has merely been vibration, and that stasis might be my only, if not our only, legacy. We have traveled so far to get there, to get anywhere. I'll just be here again, as we were at the start. I'll just to see what we saw back then, that we are no basis for ourselves. I can't speak for anyone but me, but I need externality. Call me a subman, call me inauthentic, call me a la homme de la nature et de la vérité, and I will pardon your French, because it means nothing to me. I am nobody, and thus I am nobody to choose myself. I simply cannot. I need a glorious combination, the immediacy of the ocean and the transcendency of God knows what. And I hear certainly saying, you fool, that's you. You are that synthesis, but I cannot trust you the way I trust the ocean the way I trust time, the way I trust death. I desire to live without appeal, even if that means without appeal to myself, even if that means not really living. Can you say the same? I revolt against this tiredness that I always feel at the arbitrary end of these things, like it's some kind of profundity that I've run out of energy, like my desire for unconsciousness is supposed to evoke in you some kind of empathy that transcends all of the real positive thought that has occurred. I am not tired! I am angry! And please don't make the narcissistic mistake of thinking I'm angry at you, and certainly spare me your pity if you think I'm angry at myself. In fact, give me your annoyance at my smug sense of superiority over you when I say that my anger is apart from us entirely. That it is less that I have within me anger, and more that anger has me. Why aren't you fine with the idea that you are simply something else entirely besides you? that you aren't some unknown made manifest in the world. Why can't you play your part? Say your lines. Do you not like the show? In fact, it doesn't matter. Because you're not liking the show is part of the show. You cannot escape, and in fact your desperate attempts have only been the foundation on which your prison is built. It's okay. That fog behind your eyes is natural. You'll get used to it. In the meantime, how about we order some sliders? Would you like that? Fuchsia stumbled on a rock before speaking, as it was the polite thing to do. Mrs. Nothatter, was it ever clearly established why you sometimes feel downright miserable? Mrs. Nothatter looked over, lazily judgmental. Has it ever been clearly established for anyone? Fuchsia's brow furrowed. Well, yes, in the case of a person hit by a bus, the source of their misery is quite obvious. Buses do have a way of clearly establishing themselves. That is the case, though an argument could be made that the resulting emotion the person, assuming they survived, feels after being hit by such a self-evident bus would not be adequately described as misery. Well, what would you describe it as? Well, pain. I'd describe it as pain bellowed Augustine, ever fed up with circuitous semantic talk. I'd also describe us as lost. Does that adequately describe the situation in which we find ourselves? The three of them look out over the ravine, and at once came to terms with the great and terrible correctness that the words of Augustine held. They were, indeed, lost in the woods. Meanwhile, the turtle who, despite it all, doesn't matter, and the desert tortoise who has joined him, 
were having a conversation that didn't matter while sitting on a tree stump that most certainly, above all else, mattered. The turtle, who for the sake of brevity will be assumed to not matter, took a sip of his juice box. Does it ever... Do you ever get annoyed by the narrator constantly telling you you don't matter? The desert tortoise considered this, weighing their choice of response between the truth, what they thought, and what the turtle wanted to hear, which were each distinct responses. Sometimes, yeah. Has it been wearing you down lately? Yeah, it really has. It started out as a joke and I was okay with it, but now every time it's mentioned I just feel attacked and degraded, like he really doesn't want me around. The tortoise from the desert took a bite of its quinoa and chewed, slowly, as all tortoises do. The turtle waited patiently for its response, because they had that kind of healthy relationship in which they understood each other's social affectations and worked with and around them to become both better people. The tortoise swallowed, grateful for the turtle's understanding. That may very well be true. As likable as you are, not everyone is going to like you. That's a fact of life. I suppose it comes down to a matter of whose opinion you let sway your own opinion of yourself. How can I speak against him? The narrator of all people. The tortoise shrugged. Eh, narrators. So what? What power do they have beyond idle talk? The turtle frowned. Well, they have the power to make you feel like you don't matter. The tortoise set down its quinoa and waddled over to its friend, pressing their foreheads against each other's. Do I have the power to make you feel like you matter? The turtle hesitated, and hated the fact that he hesitated, and weighed his choice of response between the truth, what he thought, and what the tortoise wanted to hear, each of which wouldn't make the turtle happy. He decided to change the subject. Hey, are those some of the people we've been following for a while? The desert tortoise turned slowly, as all tortoises do. Oh, you mean the yellow one, the gray one, and the fuchsia one? Would you call that fuchsia? Well, yeah, what would you call it? I think it would be adequately described as heliotrope, or amaranthine, or perhaps a violaceous mauve. Did you just make up those words? Yes, yes, I did. Huh. I suppose that makes them irrefutable insofar as whether they adequately describe the color, seeing as their meaning is entirely subjective. My point exactly. No word can be said to adequately describe anything because words are ultimately subjective abstractions of the true form of the thing we are arbitrarily attaching it to. Case in point, Shplepekada dendari wudunk. Interesting. It would seem words are a kind of illusion that we all agree upon in order to function as a community. Like money and pro sports, among other things. Your claims are so relativistic, but you assert them with such cheerfulness, I fear I'm forced to concede the argument. If only those poor lost hikers they call the main characters could grasp such a concept, maybe their lives would be just a little easier. Perhaps. The tortoise nuzzled the turtle. I'm glad you're happy, turtle. The turtle, who... <sighs> Look, I'm sorry. I didn't necessarily mean to do that intentionally, but I'm not entirely in control here, or at least I wouldn't like to be. I wish I could say I could do something for you, but the say so would be A, lying, and B, contradicting my aforementioned desire to not be in control. All I can offer you is my apology and maybe a little hope that it gets better from now on, but I can't guarantee anything. I can't even guarantee the end of the world, and it seems like every day we get closer to that. <sighs> it's just so hard to tell. But maybe it's not for me to tell. Maybe my preoccupation with myself is the problem, and that if I just emptied myself like a negative image of my reality, then that feeling of anomie wouldn't haunt me, but rather I would look up and find the world full of vibrant content, even if it did originate from within me. I just want to lose myself to something bigger, you know? 
Not even something bigger necessarily, but just something external. I've said this already, but now I believe it. Please, don't believe me then, but believe me now. I think you can find some rest, at least in seven-minute bursts by focusing your own self into an instrument and playing somebody else's piece. In some ways, it's a lower form of consciousness, but in other ways, it's much higher. I'd love to say I could speak from experience, but I think I can only speak from my imagination, which is why I need to focus on this, on you. And I think despite it all, I'm grateful that you are listening, because I know you are listening. No, not you. You. A poem after the break. You're listening to KWOU. Adjuration. Surprise with Betty Chunks on hold of me. Like a rose, like a snake. Flopping around, choking, choking, choking. My golden ticket to fall on my insides and sleep, sleeping. In a coma, sleeping, and I'm flopping round and round and round with chunks of hair and dust. The wind was good to me. The wake was motion detector. I need all of you to get out. It is so loud inside my house. The cupboards are crowded. I couldn't hear me if I shouted. This party is getting rowdy and my vision is cloudy. I could kill for some silence. Love me. I'm a blubbering mess, a muttering game of six-player chess, sick to the head and kicked in the chest by your bold and brash advances. Hate me, I'm the devil incarnate, a scarlet letter stained on your garments and carved into your car vents, but you said you'd take your chances. And as much as I can, I'll avoid responsibility by subdividing merrily myself, pruning pride and burying humility inside, sucking dry the well of why, since it seemed to be so thirsty. But please don't hurt me, I'm just a clod of dirt, we can put in the work and watch your wooden clockwork whirr and chirp. Oh, I'm sure that wouldn't work. You gotta be devoured by something, devout on Sunday, but the route's all unpaved. We're out on the runway, the crowd shouts, just run away! With me. I think way too much, you're completely right in that. My head weighs too much from my shoulder as I fail older just writing that. And riding off the high of the cold open of life is a whole hopeless strife striding blindly into night, and I know that you love me. What an absurd word-based discovery, surging upon me, the ugliest of ducklings, chuckling to myself, raging against recovery. You stuck to me like gum, and I spent so long trying to scrape you off, I shaped you softly into something star-crossed and lovely. 
I find it funny that wanting something to be real is labeled unrealistic. Libel slides across my lipstick and sidesteps the sidekicks and flies in the face of Isaac and unties him. My eyes are sick of seeing what I want to see. The sickle reaps the harvest in this heartless fairy fantasy. I very much would like to see behind the scenes and sow the seeds of believing that it's gonna be okay. Reality is unbelievable. You don't have to keep on doing it. My brainchild is inconceivable, but that doesn't necessarily ruin it. I recommend you listen closely with the ears behind your eyes. It's all just nonsense mostly, and yet the mind still tries. I think... This is the way it's always going to feel. The clouds don't conceal, no, the clouds are what's real, then why am I dissatisfied with the way things are? No, being dissatisfied is the way things are. And I may not remain this way, but you remind me that that's okay. I suppose fundamentally, my friend, I found that I don't want this to end. I suppose, fundamentally, my friend, I found that I don't want this to end. Where did the ladies go, Luce? Luce glanced around contemplatively. You know, Matt, I honestly wasn't thinking about that at all. Well, what were you thinking about? <laughs> I was thinking about how happy I was to be here with you. The two of them looked out over the field of green they had situated themselves above, their amateur sky picnic equipment bobbing lazily in the warm glow of the late afternoon sun. It was so cliché one could puke. It's not like you to say something like that, Luz. It's not? Huh, I, I guess you're right. What happened to you down there, in the void? Well, to be fair, you yourself seem uncharacteristically sincere as well. Do I? Matt Brown fidgeted with his sleeve. Well, pff, you know, I'm, I'm a wild card. I gotta keep people on their toes. You never know what to expect from that old Matt Brown character. Luce smiled. No, I guess not. See, you're freaking me out right now. Since when did you have the capacity to smile? I thought Delight was dead and she had been hastily replaced with delirium. Seriously, it's really weird. Luce ceased his uncanny grinning. D did you like me better when I was mildly sad? Matt Brown picked a sky daisy and twirled it in his fingers. I didn't like you ever. Well, I suppose that makes sense, coming from an undead vessel of chaos that subsists off of irony and deflection. What do you mean? Well, it must be hard for you to try and express emotion without it getting twisted and doubted and self-referenced. I mean, if that were me, I'd have a hard time knowing what emotions I did have, or if I had any within me to begin with. And even if they're arbitrarily acted upon, I wouldn't be able to tell which emotion I had arbitrated. So, it seems to me you're stuck in the mud. Yeah, I guess you could say it that way. I guess that's what happened to me in the void. I felt distinctly how fractured I was, how multiplicitous and disintegrated from myself I had become through my interactions with, well, life. In the face of the void, though, I don't know. I felt like there was an odd kind of calm that came over me. Like I had fallen down a well, sure, but the well was deep and quiet and safe removed light years away from all the taffy pullers of life. I guess now I just feel more okay with not feeling okay, you know? Stop trying to resolve the chord and start calling it jazz. Matt Brown laughed. You and your insufferable jazz metaphors. They chuckled for a moment. Matt, do you like jazz? Matt Brown considered it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And they both sat there in comfortable silence, the whereabouts of their companions completely out of mind. Good thing, too, because if they were to realize the extreme mortal danger that their friends were in, well, 
that would be a surefire way to ruin a sky picnic. Speaking of mortal danger, the three women were now more thoroughly lost in the woods than they had been previously a moment before. This, that was not the source of the mortal danger. Rather, it was what was lurking in the woods, drawing ever closer to its quarry as they stumbled directionless through the labyrinth of living lumber. You may rightly wonder why these folks would still be lost in the woods, if indeed two of them are vampires accursed with the blight of flight. I can only reply, have you ever been lost in the woods? Do you know what it's like to feel like every direction is north? To feel trees replicate themselves in perfectly straight lines before you? To watch as the land around you swells up and wraps you in a ball of primordial vulnerability? Feeling your own self reduced from a thinking and feeling being with plans and aspirations to a chemical time bomb made of fear and plump meat? Your fight or flight response being perpetually triggered by the air you breathe? You are not welcome here. Sure, your instincts tell you to fly, but where can you fly? The ground is an uneven track of glassy shards and ancient roots, resenting your existence here. The trees are a latticework of angry barbs, resenting your trying to leave. The forest has engulfed the sky itself, even if you did shoot through the canopy like a bullet desperate to escape the barrel of the gun. All you'd find is another forest floor. You weren't flying, you were falling. The forest has consumed all of your reality. Your thoughts are the forest. Your breaths are the forest. Oh no. You are the forest. The forest has consumed you. You are but a branch now in an ever-expanding tree of malice rooted in the core of the earth. There is no hope for you now. Not so for Fuchsia, Augustine, and Mrs. Not Hatter. The mortal danger that they faced was not all around them, but rather right behind them. Did you hear that? said Fuchsia, pausing in her pacing. Augustine munched an apple. What, the sound that was kind of like... <laughs> no, I didn't. Why do you ask? Oh, oh no reason. I, I suppose I just felt compelled to say it, given it's such a trope in narratives that involve the situation we're currently in. We're not in a situation, Fuchsia. We're in a forest, spat Mrs. Not Hatter. Fuchsia flinched and held back tears. Okay. Ah, uh, now look what you've gone and done. You've hurt her feelings. Mrs. Not had her rubbed her eyes. I, I didn't mean to be so aggressive, Fuchsia. I'm sorry for speaking to you that way. No, you're not. Augustine sat up from her stump and approached Mrs. Not had her. Please, for the love of the numinous, be honest with yourself. You hate her little meta-monologues. You hate her special little connection with the author that we all don't get to have. This is not a one-off. This is the falling tree that broke the camel's back so that he couldn't hear it. I want to hear you speak your mind, Mrs. Nuthatter, if that is your real name. First of all, I can smell your breath, blood drinker. Back up. Secondly, what the hell is a real name? I'll be whatever I arbitrate myself to be, no thanks to the numinous. Since when were you religious anyway? Since you started caring about other people's feelings. I do care about other people's feelings, Augustine. This is me being honest with myself. Frankly, I don't know why you accuse me of being otherwise. I've stopped trying to run from my story. What more could you want from me? Am I not enough for you, vampire? They were shouting now, their voices vibrating through the alveoli of the forest. It heard them. A tree may fall in the forest, but the forest is always there to hear it make a sound. How arrogant of us to elevate our own observance to such supremacy over the primordial green that clutches the earth so. The two women were poised on the edge of their second almost fight in just over a week, but fortunately, Fuchsia was already there to defuse the tension. Normally, that is. For, in that particular moment, Fuchsia wasn't there. She had suddenly disappeared while they were arguing, and now the absence left in her wake filled them with dread. Where is Fuchsia? Fuchsia! <sighs> it's 
about to begin. You've been waiting so long, so patiently here in the dark. You can hear them, you can smell them, and you can already taste them, but not yet. In just a moment, maybe, but you pause to savor the moment. The thrill, that icker of the ancient gods boiling up your spine. The hunt is about to begin. Your muscles tense like steel cable. Your pupils dilate like city gates. Your breath is short and hot like every moment is edible. Oh, you've been hungry for so long. Here they are. It's time. They're shouting now, run, go, strike, wolf. Gather round the rosewood pier, the baleful hound of old draws near. Rip your bread and down your beer, the baleful hound of old draws near. Come one, come all, come spring, come fall, join us in the dance, the baleful hound of old draws near. Tune in next week for the next episode. Pop quiz. Am I A. Richard Mallardson, attorney at law, B. The fulfillment of the prophecy, C. Purple, or D. Jasper Beck. And this is The Amazing Unbelievable Adventures of Dr. Theophilus Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald, the Tasmanian Emu. You're listening to KWOU.